to Your Word today. And we're asking, O oh God, that the Holy Spirit would be our teacher. That He would illumine our minds to get them wrapped around the truths that You have given to us in the Bible. Bless us now, Lord, this time we have together. In Jesus' name, Amen. Amen. Alright, I call this one Digging Deeper into God's Word. And uh, i got a construction theme going here, and like uh, the guy is digging. But we're going to dig deeper into the topic of the Bible itself. So obviously i got a big Bible up here. Yeah, we can close out of the way. Um, i got a Bible up here, but there's nothing in it, but I'm going to put something in it. All right? So, I think the most profound statement in the entire Bible is found in Hebrews chapter 1, verse 1 when it said, God spoke. You realize God did not have to speak. God could have just created everything. He didn't even have to create. But He could have created everything and just said, okay, you're on your own. I'm not going to speak to you. He could have. I think the most profound statement in the Bible, that's in my own opinion, is that God spoke. Now in Hebrews 1.1, 1, 1, I want to build on this verse for a few moments to introduce us into this whole idea of uh, God speaking. It says that, uh, I, I call this revelation. That, that's normally what the doctrine of God speaking in the Bible is called. It's called revelation. And by revelation, you see, God revealed Himself. I don't know, years ago, there was a movie out called Contact. Everybody remembers that movie? Oh, yeah. Contact. Carl Sagan or was the author of it. And it had these big dishes that were looking, you know, set up, you know, that the astronomers have set up sending these waves out to space, trying to find out if there's anyone out there. And the answer is, yeah, God is spoken to us. And we're going to see how He's spoken, even through creation. But God spoke. God has revealed Himself to us. And I think this is the most profound thought in the Bible. It's called revelation because God made known to us, to man, what man otherwise could not know. And those who fill in your blanks realize whether there's an underlying word, that's, a, that's one of, it's in your thing. It's called revelation. We call it, it's revealing something. So there was something about God that we can only know if He reveals Himself. And if you think about it, God is spirit, so He's invisible. You can't see Him. Okay? And so the, the question that becomes, God is revealing Himself. He didn't have to do this. The fact that He made Himself known... That is revelation. All right? Now, because he's made himself known, it says, in the past, God spoke to our forefathers. It's therefore historical, because it was to our forefathers. God has spoken to our forefathers, to Abraham, Moses. I mean, you just go down to the Old Testament. And because he has spoken, it's an objective reality. As soon as you say something, those are words. Those words are objects that can be analyzed in a sentence, okay? You, you can, there, there's a subject, there's a verb, there's a direct object. It's an objective truth. And so what we have is a revelation from God that took place in history, and it's objective, it's a reality. It, it really exists, okay? Those are important points. It says, in the past, God spoke to our forefathers through the prophets. Now... If I were to ask what a prophet is, most people say somebody predicts the future. That's only part of the story. When uh, Moses didn't want to be the spokesperson for God, God said, I'm going to make your brother Aaron your prophet. You will put your words in his mouth, and he will tell them to Pharaoh. A prophet is when someone puts words in your mouth, and you pass them on. You're a prophet. And when God spoke to men, He put the words in their mouth so that the prophet Isaiah, Ezekiel, whatever prophet you pick, whenever they spoke, they were speaking the words that come from God. So what He's saying here is God spoke to the prophets. It's God's message. He picked certain individuals that they would then be the conduit through which the message of His word would go forth. So, in this very first verse of Hebrews 1, so powerful, in the past, God spoke to our forefathers through the prophets. And then it says, or I just want to say, there are over 40 different authors, 40 different authors in the, the Bible. Now, we know of some of them, uh, you know, Moses, David, I mean, just all the prophets, Paul, 
all together, there's 40 different authors, but it says, <clears throat> and there were 40 different authors used by God, and even more to whom he revealed himself. Adam didn't write down, maybe he did, but it's not, we don't know that he wrote down. His conversations that when God came down in the cool of the day, God revealed himself to Adam in a real way, and, uh, but that's not, we know it happened, but we don't know what God said while they were walking through the garden. Okay. We don't know what that conversation was. So he's even revealed himself to more. The expression, this is what the Lord says, occurs in the New International Version, 167 verses. That many places. Thus says the, the, the Lord. The Lord came unto me saying, and you got this expression, God is a God who speaks, and we should be the ones who listen. All right. Now, from Moses to Malachi, that's about a thousand years, uh, for the authors of the Old Testament alone, there were about 1,500 years for the whole Bible. <clears throat> so he spoke, <clears throat> giving revelation through different prophets for approximately 1,500 years. Okay. Now, it'd be maybe a little over that because if you depends on where you put Job. You know, God spoke to Job. Now, if you put him as an uh, antediluvian, okay, then uh, God spoke more than 1,500 years, maybe. 2,500 years of a recorded thing. So it all depends where you put some of the authors of the book. But the whole point I'm trying to make is God spoke, and He spoke often in the past. Not only did He speak often in the past, but He says in various ways. <clears throat> and I want to give you a number of ways in which God has spoken in the past. Through visions. Okay. Whoop, I'm sorry. I'm clicking the wrong way. Through visions. Now, a vision is quite different from a dream. And you know the difference? You're awake. <laughs> You're awake when you see it. How many of you see things in your dreams? I, I mean, you say you see it. It's very, very real. <clears throat> I had a dream one time that my crowns came off, and I swore in the morning it was real because I was at night and I was sleeping. I put them back on. So in the morning, I'm trying to take them off. Like I got to go to the doctor and make sure I get them cemented back on. It was so real. Okay, that that was that was the other way. In dreams. Okay. God spoke in dreams. Now, he spoke in vision, vision so that they actually saw something. Here, a guy is awake, okay, he's awake, and he sees something. The Apostle Paul on the road to Damascus saw Jesus in a bright light. He wasn't sleeping, folks. Boom, flash of light, and there's Jesus. He sees him. Nobody else saw him. They heard, Paul heard him say distinctly, it's hard for you to kick against the pricks, okay? Back to King James. Uh, so he, he saw and he heard. Everybody around him did not see it, nor did they hear what he heard. All they heard was a noise. A noise, okay? And so, but God spoke through visions, and I could go through a lot of visions. We did a, a week ago, Sunday. Nebuchadnezzar had that dream, and Daniel had the vision, okay? It was both combined in one passage. It's Joseph dreamed, right? And... and uh, Pharaoh dreamed and he interpreted it. Okay, we have that going on. <clears throat> he spoke in different ways through voices. The expression, the word of the Lord came unto the prophets saying, and he spoke directly to them so that they knew exactly what the Lord wanted. To be a prophet was, I mean, that had to be an awesome thing. Uh, that God was speaking to you and you are his mouthpiece. Now that didn't always make you the most popular man on the block. Jeremiah was thrown in a dungeon, in a, a, a well, okay? Because he, he was prophesying things the king didn't like. It's kind of like the preacher getting up and preaching. And he, I told somebody yesterday, I said, hey, I, one time I was standing at the door greeting people. A guy came up to me and went like this. I said, what are you doing? He said, man, I'm cleaning off my shoes. You've been stomping on my toes all morning. <laughs> Just because you're the spokesperson for God doesn't mean what you're telling is popular, okay? And that's why the prophets, all of them, they were persecuted, okay? They heard the voice from God and they passed it on. God also spoke through lots. Anybody remember the story of Jonah? Mm -hmm. That they were trying to figure out whose fault it was or a storm at sea and they started pulling the straws. They were doing lots. And the lot fell on Jonah. How many remember in the Old Testament there was a thing called the Thummim and the, the Urim and the Thummim? The stones. 
They're stones, and they're inside the breastplate of the high priest. They're the same size, dimension, and texture. They're just different colors. And if they wanted to know the will of God, you could go to the priest and ask a yes or no kind of question. The one was, usually we, we interpret, the, the light one was the yes, and the dark one was the no. And, and he would reach inside, and he'd pull that out after the question was asked. And the one he pulled out, God in his providence, hang on to that word providence, we're going to talk about it next, next week, okay? Yeah, next week. <clears throat> we'll talk about God's providence. But in God's providence, he pulled out the one that was the answer that came from God. Now, nobody else could do this. Just the high priest. Just the high priest. Okay? God spoke. He gave answers. Hey, should we go to war? Well, ask the high priest. They go to the high priest. Should we go up against him? Yes. All right. Well, should we go with all the forces? No. Should we go with 30,000 instead of 100,000? Yes, I mean, they went through this process in determining what the will of God was for them. I know what you're wondering right now. Should I buy a lotto ticket? <laughs> I don't have the stones to find out for you whether you'd be a winner. Okay. It's not that kind of lottery. This was determining the will of God, not trying to get wealthy. Okay. God spoke through theophanies. Now, some of you are studying uh, with uh, Priscilla, uh, on uh, the life of Gideon. And Gideon encountered a theophany, right? How many, how many in class? Am I right? Yeah. He, and the, the theophany, the last half of this word, phanes, means reveal. Theo means God. It's a revelation of God. God appearing. I put here the burning bush. Because in the burning bush, God appeared to Moses. And God spoke out of that bush to Moses. And so that was God speaking to Moses. See all the various ways in the past God spoke to the forefathers through the prophets? There's, there's a bunch of these. Sometimes, huh, hard to believe, God spoke through writing. Writing. In the Ten Commandments, the Bible tells us it was the finger of God that wrote on the stone and listed them. It, it was actually on the... God's... Somehow a hand appeared and just traced out on the stone uh, the words of the Ten Commandments. How many remember the book of Daniel at the Belshazzar's feast? Belshazzar was there and he had taken all the things from <clears throat> Israel when he conquered the city. He took all the, the artifacts of the temple and they're bringing out the goblets and they're drinking and pouring wine and having this big banquet. All of a sudden across the hall from him on the plaster of the wall, a hand appeared and started reading, a uh, writing. Uh, the words that nobody could interpret. Finally, they call in Daniel. He says, oh, meanie, meanie, tickle of arson. He could read them. And, and it probably wasn't just because it was Hebrew and they, they spoke Akkadian, <clears throat> but it was probably that they were in some cryptic form that he then deciphered and said, oh, yeah, meanie, meanie, tickle of arson. You've been found in the balances, found wanting. Your, your kingdom is going to be taken away from you this very night. The very day he lost his kingdom, that they were attacked and they, they lost. So <clears throat> God spoke through writing, through writing. God also spoke through miracles. There's miracles in both the Old Testament and the New Testament. They seem to go in little pockets of time. And uh, they're not just always, there's not always miracles. They're just very specific times where God is speaking. Now, <clears throat> God asked the question, what is a miracle? All right, and uh, a miracle has three aspects. Every miracle has three aspects, and often you find all three of them together. Sometimes you only find one term. The first word is power. So I put a stick of dynamite up here because the Greek word is dunamis, from which we get the word dynamite, which means power. Dynamite is like a lot of power in a stick, but it, it, it exerts the power of God. Whenever there's a miracle, it takes the power of God to do it. That's the first thing, power of God. The second aspect is Whoa, wow, that is amazing. Come on, it took the power of God to part the Red Sea, didn't it? Well, if you were there when you said, Oh, I can't believe this. And that, that's our, our life. I just can't believe it. Well, you see it. You say, I can't believe this. But it's happening. It's, it's, it's this wow factor. So that's why I got him. Wow, he's totally amazed. <clears throat> this wow factor for a believer, they just stand in wow and awe of what God is doing. For an unbeliever, they harden their heart all the more. All the more. They, in fact, when Jesus performed miracles, they either became a believer or they tried to kill him. Okay? It's because it, all, all the miracles get a response. They're intended to get a response. 
God is revealing some significant truth, and it's getting a response on the one who's receiving it. The third thing is, it's always a sign. John 20, 21 said, Truly, many miracles did Jesus in the presence of his disciples. But these are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. The word miracles in that passage, truly, Jesus did many miracles. The word miracles is literally signs. And in the Gospel of John, there are basically seven signs that Jesus did, and every one of them is pointing to some aspect of who he is. Miracles are always a revelation from God. God is saying something. He is saying something by doing the miracles. Jesus didn't do a miracle just to make a person well. If, he, if that were the only purpose, Jesus would have said, everybody get well. Whoop, we'd all be well. I mean, wouldn't that be the kind of generous thing to do? But because they're revelation, God is speaking, he's validating, he's saying some truth. Miracles occur to validate usually a spoken word of truth. And so that God was saying, this is my son. So there was this miracle, you know, that a voice came from heaven, that a dove came down upon Jesus. It was miraculous because it was saying, this was validating the statement that was being said. said so miracles have these three aspects to them. Uh, so I call a miracle, this is my definition, <clears throat> miracles are extraordinary operations of God's providence. Providence. So we're going to cover providence next week. And uh, <coughs> providence, I'll just say it now, is the continued exercise of the divine energy by which he created everything, by which he operates and runs his universe to take it to its intended goal. That's a lot. But we'll break that down next time, right? But it's yeah. the fact that God is running his universe. Sometimes, okay, normally the way God runs his universe, when a person dies, they stay dead, don't they? That's why when a person dies, well, what's the first thing you do? You're going to have a funeral. You're going to go have the surge, take him to the cemetery, put him in the ground. They normally stay dead. Are there occasions when a dead man rose from the dead grave? Yeah. Absolutely. What is that? It's a miracle. What's the miracle? It's the power of God. All right? We go, whoa, he rose from the dead. It's a sign. Jesus was raised from the dead, according to Romans 4.25, in order to show to us that he paid in full the price of our sins, and he actually accomplished our justification that when I believe in him, he will take away my sins and forgive me completely. Isn't that awesome? If he's still in the grave, he argues in 1 Corinthians 15, that you're still in your sins. All right? And so it's very, very important. It's a message from God. So miracles are this extraordinary operation of the God's divine providence to reveal himself and produce a worshipful response of amazement where you go, wow. Aren't you amazed by God's grace? I am. Yeah, it's revealed the scriptures. <clears throat> then he adds in the next verse, Hebrews chapter eleven, uh, verse chapter one, verse one and two. The second verse says this: "But in these last days, the author's days, he's saying these days in which I'm alive, okay, he has spoken to us by his Son. For example." In John 1, 1, it says, In the beginning was the Word. Now, if you were with us last time, we covered that, okay, in the last series we did. But the Word is the word logos. And the Word, he says in verse 14, became flesh. And we beheld His glory. We saw Him. We saw the living Word of God. We saw the revelation. Jesus revealed the Father to us because that's what it says in John 14, 9. Anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. He's revealing the Father. So Jesus is a revelation of God in bodily form, all right? Well, <clears throat> not only does God speak through the prophets, but he also speaks in creation. He speaks in creation. Psalm 19, 1 says, the heavens declare the glory of God. So the first thing I notice here, well, we'll see it in a moment, <clears throat> and in Romans chapter 1, verses 18 through 21, we're told that the creation itself reveals four things about God. The first thing it reveals about God, when God speaks through creation, is His glory. We saw that in Psalm 19. We also see that in Romans chapter 1. But we also see that His wrath is revealed. You ever seen the mighty force of uh, a lightning strike? All right. You ever seen the mighty force of a hurricane? Hey, there's one coming, right? Not here, but... Aren't you glad you live in Michigan? We don't get hurricanes, yeah, typhoons. Yeah, very I mean, <laughs> Wow, very few earthquakes. I mean, it's like a safe place to live. You know? 
Anytime there's one of these violent storms in creation, they call it the wrath of God. Well, you know, they're really right. In fact, but the Bible says, in Romans 1.18, that the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all unrighteousness and ungodliness of men who hold or suppress, they push down, okay, the righteousness of God. They hold it down. Now, it also displays the power of God. You look at it, power of God, Romans chapter 1, verse 20, talks about that you can see from creation God's mighty power. I think I put that whole passage in your notes, didn't I? Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. And verse 20, because it's just not coming off the tip of my tongue here. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities are seen, okay? His eternal power and His divine nature. <clears throat> this is amazing to me. In all of creation, everywhere you look, it is speaking about God. It's almost like every star, you ever seen a, a, a product that's made that says made in USA, made in Japan, made in China? Every star has written on it, made by God, Jehovah, Jesus Christ. I don't care, you get a microscope, you dial it in, you're looking at the most smallest cell. It is screaming out, created by God, Jehovah, Jesus Christ. Everything in this universe, you look completely outside yourself, in fact, I'm not going to take the time, but you look within yourself, everywhere creation, if I look inside myself, in my deepest thoughts, it is screaming out, you are an image bearer of the God who created you. Jehovah, Jesus Christ. Everywhere. You, you can't escape Him. The nature of God. And it's not about, oh, they just know of a God. No, the Bible says in this passage, when they knew God, not a God, God. God. So the whole creation is screaming out that God is the Creator. And that's it's screaming out at everybody. You see, the revelation in creation is actually very plain. It's clear. It's clear. To all people, Romans 1, 19 and 20. Everybody sees this. Now, the problem is, it's like a radio signal. The radio signal is going from the tower. God's creation is sending the signal. I'm the radio. I'm picking up the radio signals. But the problem is, the Bible says, we suppress the truth, so we turn the dialogue. That's what our sinful nature does. It turns him off. It says we suppress or we hold back the truth in unrighteousness. Men love darkness rather than light. So everywhere around us, I mean, all these Carl Sagan, all, all these, these guys that were astronomers looking into the heavens, it's all screaming at them. I'm your God. I'm your God. Turn to me. What do they do? They die off. Oh, no, this is evolution. Oh, no, this, this took billions of years to make. Oh, no. You know, this, they're, not, they're not acknowledging who he is. So the text says, they worshiped and served the creature, man, rather than the creator, who is blessed forever. Okay? And so that's exactly what they've done. They look inside, they say, oh man, we see, oh, I'm an image bearer of God. You know, he's given me intellect, emotion, and well, self-determination, self-sensibility, all these things that make me a, 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 an individual person in the image of God. And they say, oh no, I'm just an evolved thing from, you know, from a, a monkey or something. And I say, no, it's not like that at all. To do that, I have to turn it off. I've got to turn off the clear. And that's what my sinful nature does. In 2 Corinthians 4.4, 4, it says, The God of this age, Satan, blinds the eyes of the mind. Okay, blinds them. Lest they would believe the gospel. So our adversary, Satan, is making sure that when you turn it off, you keep it off. He does not want you turning that back on to see the glory of God in all the creation. You see, people are sinners and they suppress it. They're turning it off. They're turning off the signal so that they don't hear it. They, they don't acknowledge, oh, I don't see God anywhere. Now, what happens is, because they do that, this, this message in creation can only condemn you. It cannot save you. You see, everywhere in creation is telling you that I am. And what you're doing is you're turning it off because that's what your sinful nature does. So it can't save you. But now you're condemned because you know the truth, but you're turning it off. You're turning it off. And so because... Everybody stands before God guilty. Even without a Bible. They stand before God guilty. Because He's been screaming at Him in everything that is made. I'm your God. I made this. I made you. And But they've turned it. They've dialed it off. 
they can't get saved by creation. It's only enough material to condemn them. So what they need is a special revelation. People need a special revelation. God intruding, and that's where the gospel comes in. God intruded in space and time. Long ago, through the prophets, to the fathers, He has spoken, but in these last days by His Son, He's spoken through the Son, Jesus Christ, that He is the Savior of the world. God gave special revelation so that if you believe in the special revelation, your eyes are opened and you look at all creation and say, whoa, look what God has done. you got to be saved in order to receive the signals. If you're not saved, you've turned the radio off. The signals are still coming, but you're just not getting them because you don't have the power on within to receive the signal. And that's what the Holy Spirit, He comes and invades, He opens our eyes, we understand, and we see what God has done. So God gave us special revelation, and uh, that special revelation is in the Lord Jesus Christ. It's in our scriptures. It's in the Bible. Now, I just want to review here. God spoke through the prophets, through visions, through dreams, through voices, lots, theophanies, writings, miracles, incarnation. He spoke in all those ways. Some of that revelation was actually written down. We call it being inscribed. Because it's inscribed, that revelation from God that was inscribed is what becomes Scripture. Scripture. And so my Bible, because it is the re recorded record of God revealing, it's Scripture. And that Scripture is the revelation that's come from God. Is this making sense? Yes. Okay. All right. I, I got for discussion. I just want to ask you a, few, a couple of questions. Since God speaks through all creation, what, the, what, what does God impress on you the most when you look up at the heavens? What do you see? You look up at night, crystal clear. I can tell you a story. Get you going on this. <laughs> we were going up to Area 51. Anybody familiar with Area 51? It's out in the desert in Nevada. It's supposedly where they you know, took uh, aliens after they crashed and that kind of thing. And they, they got the spacecraft there, you know, the flying saucer. So we went up to the gates of Area 51. And uh, of course, they don't let you in. There's cameras there, and it's a sign warning, and then there's usually a little black truck up on the hill with the guys in their black suits, and because you know, just like they see in the movies. And we pull up, and it can't do anything, but it's the anomaly. I always wanted to go there, but we're going back, and it, it's dark as can be. But we're out in the middle of the desert. You, you look for miles, and there's no car that way. You look for miles the other way. There's no car that way because it takes like four or five hours. Over. We saw like two or three cars. So we know there's nobody on this road, so I park the car right in the middle of the road, get out, lay down on the asphalt. <laughs> no cars are coming. And you look up, and you can see, because there's no light pollution. Not, not from Vegas, and, you know, that's where we left from, it was Vegas on it. You could see the bands of the star uh, of the Milky Way. And, and it was like, you could just see it so clearly. You could see satellites weaving across the sky as the light was reflecting off of them because it was so crystal clear. And, and I lay there and I look and I see stars that I've never seen before because I'm always in a city with light pollution. It's like, oh my goodness. Here's what I said. My God is so big. Because <laughs> it says that's all in the span of his hand. You realize how big my God is? It's the whole universe in the span of his hand. What's your response? Okay, you go out and you see a sunset sky. What do you think? What hits you? Jumping. Anyway. Hmm? Miracle, I think. A miracle. You know, that's really right, because God is speaking. God is speaking through that whole thing and saying, I am the God who painted this sky. Do you realize it doesn't have to be painted? God could have run his opera or run his universe so that it was all in black and white. So why did he do that? For my pleasure. For my pleasure. Isn't that awesome? I, when I see a, a beautiful spade, a painted sky, I just say, I, I'm blown away by it, and I just say, God, I know that you did that for me. God, God, God is, see, God, I got this personal relationship with God, and He's acted in my life. When you see snow, a beautiful snow, what, 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 what's that do to you? You say, I stayed here too long. Should have been in Florida? <laughs> <laughs> Come on, what do you, what, how does that speak to you? Awesome and beautiful. Yes. So pure, white, right? And then the individual snowflakes. Oh, everyone is different. 
What's that, what, what's that speak to your heart about God? Feel His presence. His presence. His creativity. His creativity. Every one of those snowflakes is different. Man, you are a creative God. All right? It's like all of us are different. Every, every person on the planet, even identical twins are different. Our God is so vast, so great. And so everywhere in this universe, it speaks to us. Now, of all the other methods of revelation, not creation, but all the other ones that he, he do, has done, which seems most unusual to you? What's the most unusual way that God speaks? You think it's through a dream, a vision? You think it's through a casting lots? You think it's through a writing? You think it, what's the most unusual? What, what do you think is the most, wow. Hey, do you remember in the Old Testament? I didn't record them all, I couldn't. Remember when the donkey spoke to Balaam? God was speaking out of the donkey's mouth. Come on. What, what, what are we going to say? The human body. The human body. All right? Well, what do you mean by that? The complexity of the human body is so complex. I mean, it's just astounding. Yeah. And even to the doctors, scientists, everybody, they can't figure it out. Yeah. Just miles and miles of blood. Hmm? The human end. The human head. Just the eye. Sir, is there a way to get out of this world? I think he speaks through other people who have more wisdom than you do. I think there's truth there too, yes, yes. And you have to test the spirit because not everybody who proclaims to be a wise man is a wise man. I used to have a friend who used to say, well, the fool could ask a question that the wise man couldn't answer. It's always harder to have an answer than it is to ask a question. Questions, answers to questions are harder than the questions. So, yeah, I always have... If it's a good question, it doesn't normally get a good answer, is my response. <laughs> because it takes a really wise man. What do you got? Uh, it's along Al's line, and it was just a newborn baby, Jill, who comes with us to church. I remember the first time that I really held her in my arms and looked at her, and she was the third or four, but yeah. that first time that I looked at her, I saw somebody looking back, and I thought, how could that happen? How could there be another human being because I mean you go to science class and you learned what happens but that's not I I couldn't make a human no but there was somebody looking back and how do you make a soul I mean it gets really complicated here oh wow, God our God is awesome you can see that in all the creation all that he's done and discussing well some of that revelation was actually written down and became scripture and that's what I want to turn our discussion to now and I want to pick a different verse in 2 Timothy 3.16, see there's my word scripture. Scripture is inscribed revelation. Okay? And so it says in 2 Timothy 3.16, this is one of those famous verses you've got to memorize. It says, all scripture is God breathed. Now I memorized it as a kid in uh, King James. All scripture is given by inspiration of God. But the word inspired, okay, and let me let me start from the very beginning of the verse. The word all means every single word. Every scripture, every piece of that scripture, all of it. So I left my Bible on the front row, and I didn't mean to do that because I wanted to lift it up. So but I hit my, my Bible. I'm just I'm looking to see if we got one because I've had them in here for the youth. We must put them back. But you got a Bible there. It's just like. Man, does she have a Bible. Whoa, that's a Bible. Yeah, see, that's why I behave. Uh, <laughs> 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 oh, pen, man, she just hits me with the Bible. <laughs> every, every word, all parts of this. Now, I'm not talking about her's got you know study guide notes and all that. No, 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 no. The words that the prophet gave, okay, in the recording. Those notes could be inaccurate, wrong, you know, because they're not inspired. But the word, the text, every word. All scripture. And the next word is all scripture. That which has been inscribed. Then it says, is God breathed. God breathed equals the source. Actually, the word God breathed is a verbal adjective. Now, there's a one for you. For all you grammarians, it's a verb. Breathe. Breathe is a verb. But it's used to describe the scriptures. So it's a verbal adjective. Although it's a verb, it's an adjective describing a quality that this book has. This book, the scriptures, has the quality of having its source in God, not in man. This is a really important verse. My Bible is the Word of God. All right? 
It's different than the New York Times. <laughs> it's different than the Wall Street Journal. It's different than any novel. It's different than any history book. Because all of those have had their source in a man. But the Bible is saying the source for the Bible is in God. So that when I have my Bible and I read it, I can say, thus says the Word of God. This is what God is saying to us. Now, not my interpretation, but the words. So that's why I go overboard trying to put the words up on the screen for you to see. Because it's not my opinion that's important. It's not my interpretation that's important. It's the Word of God that's, that's important. And, and, and I want you to memorize it. I want you to study it. I want you to know it. And now, my, my interpretation on things have changed over time, but you know what? The text never changed. It's still the same text. Because I'm in the process of trying to put it all together. All right? And I've had a lifelong pursuit of this. I started at 16 years old, and you know, I'm 66, so I've got 50 years of trying to put the whole thing together, and I'm still at it, okay? So it's not my opinions that are important. It's, it's not my interpretation that's important. It's the text. The Bible, all Scripture, has got a quality that its source is from God. That is God's Word. The product of the Bible is what is inspired, so that it is the Word of God. Most people, when they talk about inspiration, talk about the person being inspired. Like, God inspired Paul to write. That's wrong. God inspired what Paul wrote is correct. The Scriptures are inspired, God read, not Paul. Isaiah, what he wrote, he wasn't inspired. The final product of what he wrote, that is God breathed. Isaiah wasn't. He was just a tool in the hand of God to get it. So that's why we in the evangelical community, and those of us with a thorough Baptist background, we believe in the first first thing that we believe in, the first distinctive is called biblical authority. It's the Bible. We base everything on the Bible. We don't base it on creeds, we don't base it on church edicts, we don't if our constitution, somebody said, Oh, this isn't what the Bible says. The Constitution gets changed for the church, and the Bible is our guide. It's absolutely the foundation, because it is the Word of God. Now, it says all Scripture is, is uh, God-breathed and is useful for teaching. That's why I try to teach this book. It's useful. It, it's got a purpose for your life, my life. Some people call this like your guidebook to survival, okay? Because this is useful. He said, not only for teaching, but rebuking. Oh, that happens. That's that guy coming out, cleaning off his shoes. You know? I was going through the book of Amos at a previous church. And uh, I was preaching my heart out on this book. And one of the godly ladies in the church, I thought she was a godly lady. She came up to me and she said, you're killing me. I said, no. She had something going on in her life I had no idea about. And she thought I was speaking just to her. And, and, you know, God was working on her heart, changing things in her life. And, and she just, she said, you're, you're just killing me. <laughs> right? I wasn't doing that. The Word was rebuking to correct her and to train her how to be righteous. I had no idea that was going on in her life. It says, so that the man or woman of God may be thoroughly, completely equipped for every good work. And for every good work, the Bible says we will get a reward. All right? So this is awesome. That's, the Bible is our, our roadmap to success. So the question is, how did God make the Scriptures God breathe? That becomes the question. And so I want to give the answer to that. Found in another passage, in 2 Peter 1, 20, 21, it says, no prophecy of Scripture. Okay? Remember, prophecy is not just telling the future. It's when God reveals to the prophet through all those different means so that he passes it on to people. So what he's saying is every truth of Scripture that came from above came about by, it says that it did not come about by the prophet's own interpretation. So Isaiah then just said, oh, you know, let's just say, I think I should write this today. Uh, Moses didn't say, you know what? The people need the Ten Commandments because they're such a disorderly mob. I think I'm going to come up with ten rules. Didn't start with that. 
There's not one part of this book, not one part, that starts with the person, okay? It comes from God. Now, that's not to say that it doesn't incorporate and write down the things that did come from men. You know, Nebuchadnezzar said some things, and he was a pagan king, okay? But the Bible, God told the prophet what to write. He wrote it accurately, the correct way, even recorded lies. Do you know that the Bible records lies? Satan said to Eve, oh, the day you eat thereof, you won't die. God just knows that you'll be like him. He lied to her, but it was accurately written down exactly the way it was said. And so it is truthfully recorded that lie. Wow, this gets really interesting, doesn't it? Yeah. No prophecy of Scripture came about by the, the person's own individual desires, his own will. He didn't make it up. The men didn't make it up. For prophecy never had its origin in the will of man. Never. Never. It did not originate in man. This is so important. But men of God, they spoke from God as they were carried along. I call this doctrine superintendence. God was superintending, carrying along, bearing up, holding up the prophets by the Holy Spirit. When I was a boy, we got a swimming pool in the backyard. It was above ground. It was a circular one. It had the filter with the hose that went over the top. One sucked it in, the other one blew it out. The one that blew it back into the pool had a little bend to it, so it made a circular motion in the pool. So my brother and I would make ships. You go to a store, you buy these plastic ships, you build them out of models, and you know, get it all done. We go in, we turn on the filter, and we put the boat in the water, and we would race our boats around the pool. Because wherever the water went, it carried along my boat. If we stopped the filter, right, Guess what happened to the boat? It stopped. It stopped. You see, it was carried along by the water. Here it says, these men, the prophets, when they were writing the scripture, prophecy of scripture, that which is recorded, this message from God, when they were writing that down, they were actually being carried along by God so that the very word God wanted in the scripture was placed there. And so this is what I say. Just as the pen was in the hand of the prophet. Oh, I want some of you got red, red letter edition of the Bible. All right. So if you wanted a black ink, he picked up the black pen and wrote. If you wanted the red ink, he picked up the red ink. All right. That kind of thing. Just as the pen was in the hand of the prophet, so the prophet was in the hand of God. So when God wanted a brilliant mind, oh, he prepared in his providence a man by the name of Paul. And Paul writes the letters to Romans and Galatians, and he's got profound, logical arguments because God wanted the pen. Oh, that's Paul. I created him just for that specific purpose, to put my word, and so he uses Paul to write it. So it's got Paul's personality. It's got Paul's logic, and yet it's exactly what God intended, even with his personality. Now, then he picks up the pen and he says, oh man, I want everybody to know how much God loves the world. So I'm going to pick John, the beloved John. And when John, you know, he, he, he's like in blue ink versus the red ink, you know, the one that read it, logical, crossing out, correcting everything, it's so logical. He's in blue ink, and this is so heavenly. And he writes, God prepared John. Like you would prepare your inks. He, he prepares John. All this personality, all the circumstances in his life, providentially, so that when he records the message from God, it reflects his personality and all, but the end result, it didn't originate with the prophet, it originated with God, it just reflects that he's using them as the instrument. Does that make sense? This is what God is doing, that's what I have in my Bible. Every word that the prophet wrote was the exact word that God intended to be written. My Bible is the word of God. It's the Word of God. All right, it's what God intended. As such, I'm suggesting that the Bible is without error. There's no errors in the Bible. Listen, Hebrews 6.18 states it this way. It's impossible for God to lie. So if there's an error, that would be a falsehood. That would be a lie. But it's impossible. So when God was using these men to write the Scripture, there's no errors in the Bible. Jesus said it this way. Sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. The Bible is the truth. 
It's the truth. So I can rely on it, count on it, not interpretations of it. I mean, a lot of interpretations about end time prophecies. And the prophecies are right, but not all the interpretations are correct. All right? That's what the, the Word of God is correct. Now, the question then becomes, I got, I got this Bible, all these manuscripts, they're scripture, they're inspired by God. So what books belong in the Bible? I'm going to suggest only God-breathed books belong in the Bible. If it is the inspired Word of God, God-breathed, the ones that God <clears throat> revealed Himself to the prophet, He wrote it down with His own individual style, but He was carried along by the Holy Spirit, those books only are the books that are be in the Bible. Therefore, the standard or the, what's called the measuring rod for what book belongs in the Bible is God-breathedness. Is it God-breathed? The word uh, canon, in the ancient word, the word canon was used for a measuring rod. We call it a measuring rod. Their word was canon. And, and if you were going to measure something, you'd take the canon to see if it was the right size, if it measured up. That word is what has been translated over to the Bible, the canon of Scripture. What are the, what are the books that measure up to being God-breathed and should be included in the Bible? So that's the question we're asking. A book is not God-breathed because it's canonical. That's really important. It wasn't like there was a group of people that met and said, okay, we're a holy council, and we're going to determine what books belong in the Bible, and we're going to set the canon. No, they didn't decide it. A canon, it is a canonical book. It's in the canon because it's God-breathed. It's measured up. It shows that it's God-breathed, breathed forth from God. So the canon was recognized by the church not determined by the church. It was recognized. Now there were councils and all that in years gone by where the church collectively got together and said, what books do we hear God speaking from? All right? And then they determined that. Now, I want to go to John 10, 25. Jesus answered and said, the miracles I do in my Father's name speak. I've said that before. Miracles speak because they're revelations. When a miracle is done, there's a revelation there. It's pointing to something. It's pointing to Jesus Christ. They point to Christ. It's my, so it's, it's a revelation from God. The miracles that I do in my Father's name speak for me, but you do not believe because you are not of my sheep. My sheep, listen, listen. Believers are the sheep of Christ. When I became a, a Christian, I became a sheep. Jesus is the great shepherd. He takes care of his sheep. He says, believers are my sheep, they listen to my voice. Okay, believers hear Christ, Christ's sheep hear his voice in the word of God. Down through the ages, believers have heard from the Bible God speaking to them corporately over the ages. <clears throat> and they follow his voice. What I am suggesting here is that down through the ages, believers historically... The, the, the sheep as a corporate entity called the church down through the ages have recognized God's voice in only 66 books. Only 66 books, those that are found in our Bible. They have found value in other books, that's for sure. The Maccabees, yeah. Ezra, yeah. They found, so there's historical data there that's really helpful. But they say, no, that's not where God speaks. Historically, the church down through the ages has heard God speak only in the 66 books. And they recognized, hey, those are the books that have been God-breathed because we hear the voice of God in those books. And so they have corporately acknowledged the canonical books. Does that make sense to you? They don't determine it. We recognize what already existed. So the Bible is a library <laughs> of 66 books. And uh, with different authors uh, developing one theme from one cover to the other, all about the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ in His first and second advent and uh, setting us up for all eternity. I want to talk about preservation. I'll turn the corner here. Talk about preservation of, of the Bible. In Matthew chapter 5, Jesus says, I tell you the truth, until heaven and earth disappear. Well, we're still here, right? Not the smallest letter and not the least stroke of a pen will by any means disappear from the law until everything is fulfilled. He's saying here that the Word of God, God providentially has preserved the Word of God. You cannot destroy it. Believe me, people have tried, but it cannot be destroyed. 
Now, I want to talk to you for a moment just about the smallest letter. Okay? I got the Hebrew up here, and this is from Genesis 1 1, Bereshith Barra Elohim. And the very first word, Bereshith, okay, has within it the smallest letter of the Hebrew alphabet. Now you say, wait a minute, I see other things up here that look smaller. Well, you see all these dots? Hebrew, originally written, had no vowels. Everything up there that's not a dot is a consonant. You just knew the vowels that went with it. Like if I were to write the word S-C-H-L, what word would come to your mind? School. School. You would know that. And I could, I could probably take the vowels out of a complete sentence and you would know what it means. Just because of the consonants in there. That's why Hebrew. Hebrew didn't waste time with the, the vowels. Well, when the language be, started to die as a spoken language, the rabbi said, we had to come up with a way to record how it's supposed to be pronounced. So they put little dots above the letters and in the letters, around the letters, but they didn't touch the letters. And those were the vowels. So the dot inside that uh, base, that, that dot means it's a hard B, not a B. Your, your, your B can be hard or, or soft. That's a hard B, B. The two dots below is the letter E, as in the word the, uh, uh, that little uh. So it's B, okay? And so what they've done, all the way through the words, they've done that, Bereshith, Ba, Ra, Elohim, okay? And, and they've, that's what you got to read. You got to pronounce it. You got to look at all the dots. Okay, it gets a little complicated. But the smallest letter is just a little tiny curl, apostrophe. It's an apostrophe. All right. So he said, the smallest letter of the text will not disappear. Then listen to this. He gets even more particular than that. And not the least stroke. Now this is the letter R. It's a resh. Okay. But the difference between a resh and a dalit, the letter R and the letter D, is just simply this. Oh, you just put a little, little overhang. Uh, the little overhang would change it from bat rashith to bedashith. It would be a D sound. So what you have here is, he said, even among the letters, not a letter's going to be changed. Okay, whoa, this is pretty powerful. God has promised to preserve His Word. He's promised to preserve His Word. It will not disappear until everything has been accomplished. All right? Now, none of it's going to disappear. It has been settled forever. All right? Therefore, here's my conclusion on this promise of Jesus. God has preserved His Word. God has preserved His Word. Not only has He preserved His Word, but somewhere within all that manuscript evidence, when we've got discrepancies in passages, one of them is right. Because he has promised to preserve his word. So we have a whole science called textual criticism. The science of textual criticism is analyzing, studying, trying to figure out which is the most accurate rendering of a passage. And uh, they, they discuss every kind of possible variant that could be there and they put it and they footnote it in both the Hebrew Bible and the, the Greek New Testament and that if you're a scholar you can follow all the arguments on this and <clears throat> but they don't normally amount to a hill of beans I mean they argue over for example if I were to say to you um, we had um, an abundance of rain you would know that abundance all right means a lot of rain. But if I said, wow, you gotta try these eggs on your sandwich because they'll really make a bun dance. <laughs> Same word. It's just how do I divide the words? How do I divide the letters? <laughs> Those are considered discrepancies when they come to the science of textual criticism. Oh, they ran the words together because both in Greek and in Hebrew when you run things together, it makes different words with different meanings, okay? And so how do we divide the letters? It has often a discrepancy, it has nothing to do with the text, it, it's all there, it's just how do we separate it all? It, it, you cannot you <coughs> get the meaningful, really meaningful variants within the scriptures and put them on a page, they probably wouldn't fill a half a page. The rest are very, very small, and so 
within that manuscript evidence, and that's what, what scholars, they, they pour over and they spend their lifetime with ar arguing why it should be one way or the other, trying to maintain the integrity of the text and saying, in the bottom line, <coughs> it's forever settled in heaven. When we get to heaven, you can say, yep, it was this version, and I left it there for you. Yes, there was other, other variants, but I left it there. Somewhere within the whole body of those manuscripts, God's Word still is there. So what I want to say, our Bible, this Bible that we have right here, as it accurately translates the original text as they were written by the, the prophets, the apostles and all, that is the Word of God. When I my translation accurately represents <coughs> that, I have the Word of God. And I'm telling you, the variants are so small and the translations are so much, so close to saying the same thing that I, I'm very confident and safe to be able to say my Bible this Bible is the Word of God. Thus says the Word of God. And that's what we base our faith and our practice on. And God has promised to preserve His Word. Because this is so, all right, because this is all so, God's normal way of speaking to us today is actually through His Word. It's through His Word. Later we'll talk about tongues, all right, when we get to the doctrine of the Holy Spirit. God's normal way of dealing with us today is through His Bible, not through tongues. Right. God's normal way of speaking through the Bible. That's the way He speaks to us, through the Bible. He wants us to read the Bible, study the Bible, know this Bible. His Word is forever settled, okay? He, he wants us to know that. It's not primarily through miracles. Can a miracle happen? Oh yeah, I can't live at God. But primarily, He speaks through the Bible. And so I, if I want to have a relationship with God, I've got to have a I gotta have a relationship with my book, the Bible. I gotta be in a Bible study. I gotta read the Bible. Because that's where God speaks normally in the age to us today. Alright? Now I got a, a discussion question here. In your own words, what does it mean that the Bible is God breathed? Somebody just paraphrases back to me. What does it mean that the Bible is God breathed? I always thought it was the inspired word of God. It is the inspired word of God. And, but what does that mean? It's inspired. It's like he brings one point. Inspired. God is the author. And actually, inspired is kind of a little misleading because it's not that he took it in. He, it would really be he expired it out. He spired, spirated it forth. This book, that book is the Word of God. Yeah, because that's the opposite of what he said. Well, not opposite, but it's, how it's you misleading take it. when you say inspired. Your perspective. Because it means that he inspired me to write this, but I wrote it the way I wanted to. Mm -hmm. Right. And the other way it says... That it is his word. And that's what it's inspired. The book is inspired. Yes, good. good. Any other thoughts on that? It's like Hebrews 1.1. 1, 1. Yeah, Hebrews 1.1. 1, 1. God spoke. Yeah. And he's recorded it in the Bible. God is the ghost water writer. <clears throat> yeah. Yes. Yeah. That's good. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> Very good. Yeah. Very good. Thank you. I got another one. In your own words, how did God breathe the Bible? Through the prophets. Through the prophets. I told a long story about my little book. He carried along the prophets. He controlled them in providence so that they were the exact person he needed to write those words at that time. So the Bible has reflects character of, of the man's personality, but it's the word that he wanted. How would you explain to someone how we arrived at 66 books in the Bible? The ones that were God-breathed. They're the God-breathed books. <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you. Hey, did you know the original King James Version included all the Apocrypha? The original King James Version included all the apocryphal books. In fact, I got a set of the apocryphal books, uh, just the King James versions of them in my library somewhere. So, so a Catholic Bible has some extras, Judith and Pope. Yep, they have the apocryphal books in it. Yes. So those are apocryphal. Uh -huh, they're the apocryphal books. They've included them. They still include them. When You want to know how they got out of there? Yeah. They originally, when they were printing the Bible, after Gutenberg's printing of the Bible, okay, uh, they were wanting to make the Bible, the inspired books, available to everybody trying to get the cost down. They all said, hey, listen, we recognize these are, are good books, they're devotional books. It's kind of like, you know, Devotional Daily Bread or The Purpose Driven Life. You've read those books. Devotional, they're good books. 
but they're not scripture. So if we take those out and just leave the God read books in, we can reduce the cost of the Bible to get it into the hands of the people. And so that's what they did. They said those books which are not recognized by the church universal as being the word of God, they then remove those and that's where all all the all but the Roman Catholic Bibles, when they print them, have do, do not include the apocryphal books. And there's some of those apocryphal books, if you read them, you'll see why that they're not included in there. You can say, Oh my goodness, this can't be right. So all right. Any other questions? I want to talk about interpretation, okay? <clears throat> I think I still have a few minutes. Uh, interpretation. Since God has spoken to the past, to our forefathers, through the prophets, the revelation is both historical, it actually took place in time and history. Now, this became quite a big issue some years ago among the German theologians. Because in German, there's two different words for history. History and Geschichte. And they have two different meanings. History is historical event and Geschichte is like a once upon a time a fairy tale history okay and so some of the theologians began to try to say the Bible when it talks about religious things uh, is actually in Geschichte history it's in a another religious history not in a real real everyday history and that when it's talking about real factual things like a king David yeah that took place in real history and so they tried to split these out but I'm suggesting everything took place in historical history. Everything. There is no such thing as Geschichte history uh, once upon a time. That's not history. That's fairy tale. We know that. And that's, that's a reality. The second thing is not only did it take place in real time in history, it's objective because it took place in reality. So when it says Jonah went to Nineveh, I should be expect that there actually was a city of Nineveh. And I should be able to go there and do archaeology and study and find that. When it says Jesus performed a miracle at Cana of Galilee, all right, well, I should be able to find Cana, and archaeologists have. You know, when it says Jesus was taken up to the uh, up to the temple mount, you know, to the pinnacle of the temple, there should be a historical real pinnacle of the temple. And it just so happens all those things that we have found archaeology-wise, and it confirmed it. Yeah, these things are all history. The whole the whole Bible is like that because it's historical and objective. The interpretation of the Bible must also be done historically. That means I got to take the Bible literally. Now, when I take the Bible literally, that doesn't mean that there's not figures of speech. I tried to explain that this morning in the message. Okay, where it says, you know, one day, two day, or three days. That was an uh, that was an idiom of their time. So you you take an idiom as an idiom, but I take that literally as an idiom. And so when there's an allegory in the Bible, we got we saw that in the Book of Galatians. Uh, that I know that that is an allegory and it's not a reality, okay? When it, when it talks about a parable, a parable is a story that's made up and it's thrown alongside a truth it wants to illustrate. The parable is not a real thing, but the truth that it's trying to demonstrate is the reality. And so I, I take all these figures of speech literally as being figures of speech, but there is a message behind them all. So the, historically, I take it literally, and then objectively, I take it grammatically. The subject is the subject, the verb is the verb, the direct object is the direct object. Uh, the prepositional phrases are modifiers, and I go through and I go through all that task. I thank God for technology, you guys. I got my computer Bible. I don't have to diagram the passages anymore. I just click on the one thing and it's all diagrammed for me. I mean professional diagrammers, I mean a whole book of the Bible. I've got the book of Romans, Corinthians, I've got a bunch of them that I've done by hand, okay? Because when I'm studying this book, I want to know what is modifying what. And not, I don't only have them in English, i got them in Greek, i even got some in Hebrew, i got Psalms that are done in Hebrew. If you ever see my, my little notebooks, they're the weirdest looking little things, but it's the only way. Now you just push a little button and shh, does it all for you, and you can see what modifies what, it just speeds up all the research. But I take it objectively. This is, this is God's revelation. I want to know exactly what was he saying in that time, historically. What did it mean to them then? 
to whom was he talking and why was he talking? Why did he say it the way he said it? And then I say, how does that translate into the age in which I live? Because that's where the application comes. But I can't make an application to a falsehood, so I gotta know what it really said. And so, this is interpretation. So I've got this boiled down to three simple steps, okay? If you do these three simple steps, you can interpret any passage of the Bible. Now I say simple, I mean, as I boil them down, there's some points that make it a little more complicated. The first one is investigate. When you read a passage, and you're gonna study, you've got to notice everything and cover the, un the, the meaning, uncover the meaning of every word, every phrase, every place that's mentioned in a grammatical historical context. So I'm reading this passage when it says, for God so loved the world. The world there, the Greek word is cosmos, cosmos. Cosmos, the universe. That's what it is, the universe. God so loved the cosmos. <coughs> but is he really talking about the universe or is he talking about the people in our globe and our planet. See, I gotta, I gotta go then through and find out what is the meaning, what are all the possible meanings, but then in the context, with all the other words around it, what does he mean by that word? And so this is this is uh, this is real Bible state where I am uncovering all the words. I come across a word like justification. I gotta ask myself, what does that word mean? Atonement. What does that word mean? And there's a bunch of these with sanctification. What does that word mean? All right? Simple word like for. There's several different Greek words for for. So I look up in my Bible and say, what does this word for? Oh, this means a substitutionary, took the place of. Or, you know, it can mean because of. We did it for a certain reason. I investigate the meaning of every single word and try to connect them in the context of what is that verse saying in the time in which it was said. Secondly, I interrogate the text. I ask the hard questions. Who is he speaking to? Who is he writing to? All right. When did he do this? Uh, when did he perform this miracle? Where was it performed? <clears throat> what, what, what is this passage really talking about? Why did the apostle say it this way? Why does Moses, when he writes, he tells certain stories three times, four times, why does he repeat them? Oh, what is missing? I go back to the, what's there. What's not only what's there. What did he leave out? Every important. You, you know, you got the, the story where where Moses spoke to the rock. I mean, he, first he was supposed to strike the rock. Remember that? And water would come out of it. Second time God said to him, Moses, speak to the rock. And what did Moses do? Strike. He struck it again. What is significant about that? Well, that was disobedience. You want to know what's really significant about that? We all know it as disobedience. You know what Moses called it? Disbelief. Called it what? Dis Disbelief. Dis he did not believe. And this is a crucial passage because Moses is writing about himself. And when you would expect him to have said, he disobeyed, Moses said, I didn't believe. The just shall live by faith. If I had believed, I would have obeyed. You see, you see the profound impact? So you're watching. You're watching what it says, why he said it, and how he said it. You're looking for all these little clues. You're, you're the investigator. That's what you're like Sherlock Holmes, not leaving anything untouched, unseen. And you're asking questions till you come up with the answer that leads you to a deep answer of what this passage is really about. And then here's a part you got to do. You've got to integrate. You've got to harmonize the whole thing together. It's like cogs in a wheel. The things that I read in one passage can't contradict what I read in another passage. For example, in the book of Romans and Galatians, a man is justified, all right, by the grace of God through faith. Isn't that correct? Mm -hmm. When you read in James chapter 2, a man is justified by his works. Uh-oh. Which one is it? The cogs of my doctrines are banging on each other. <laughs> they're, not, they're not meshing. And so, uh, how is it? Well, when you read carefully the book of James, he's saying, if you have a genuine faith, it will be shown in what you do. So, your works reflect that you have a genuine faith, so you are justified by your works. Because if you say, I believe, but there's nothing in your life to show you believe, 
you're a liar. You're not really justified. You've smoke screened yourself. You've told yourself a lie. So you got it's, it's, it's a meshing of the two. And that's what we got to do. We got to harmonize the scripture. Why? Because in the book of Peter, it says, no passage of scripture is given for private interpretation. I can't isolate one verse and build everything on that verse and ignore the rest of the scriptures. I have to integrate that with all the rest so that I have a harmonized doctrine and teaching. All right? So, I want to hit on just a few teaching tools because some of you are going to be teachers. Right? It's very simple. When you're doing a lesson, you've done all your study, you've done all that, put that together, you found the main theme of your passage. You know, you come to John 3, 16, and you've got this verse, for God so loved the world, you want to talk about the love of God, and so you're going to find a hook. The hook is something like a story, something to hook them in about love, all right? And so you got the hook out there, you know, there's a kid who, who uh, everybody treated terribly, and then one day a teacher came in and bent over backwards and helped this kid because this teacher just loved the child. And here you're, you're dealing with kids who are probably from broken homes or something like that. And you, you got a hook, you got to pull them into the story. Once you got them hooked in, you say, let's go to the book. Let's look at how God loves you. And then you write, you go to the text, and you read the passage, and you try to unfold the passage. You're going to the book. This is the heart of all Bible teaching. You take them to the book, all right? You try to hook them with something to get their interest, and then you go into the book, and you show them the text, and then after that, you look for the truth that's in that text. You see, if God so loved the world, and he loved that kid in my story, you know what? God loves you too. See now, I, I, you see this truth in the Bible? See what I'm doing? He loves you. God so loved the world. And so then what I want to do is, hey, the took. So I, I didn't make these up, okay? But uh, I borrowed these. Hook, book, look, took. Take it with you. I want you to take the love of God with you. Because if you're feeling bad and the love of God makes you feel good, just think what it'll do with somebody else if you make them feel good too. You share that faith with them too. And so just a simple teaching tool of how I'm going to teach the Bible uh, with others. Whew. I'm done. But that's a lot, huh? <laughs> Next week we're going to shift the top. <laughs> Digging deeper into the knowledge of God. We're going to study what theologians have called the doctrine of theology. Uh, God. Who God is, what God has done. And uh, we'll spend... Uh, the whole time that we have just focusing. We're going to have soup and a sandwich next week. So after the service, well, like we did last uh, winter, we had uh, soup and a sandwich and clear tables. And then we're going to look at the topic of who God is and what God has done.